Yeah. Yeah. Hate to do it, but that's what the schedule demands. Yeah, well, you know, I think you guys have earned it. <laughs> okay, so since we have not so much time today, rather than review what we've been doing with Fabry Perot's, I figured we'd just jump right in. But nonetheless, back on Fabry Perot's, what's your takeaway? Filter, it's useful. Awesome. filters. Okay. So I heard a couple of things. So, so tell me, tell me to me again. One takeaway. Band pass filter. Or just the act. Very like narrow band pass yeah, filter yeah. with repeated bands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Mark, you said what? I was saying, I was just saying that. So it's more like uh, bank of filters. Yeah. Okay, Alex, what was it you said? Useful. Well, <laughs> there we go. That sounds about right. <clears throat> Lasers. A laser cavity is a fabric pearl. And what are the wavelengths a laser cavity can laze at? It's the transition modes of the fabric pearl. So those are the wavelengths it can laze at. <clears throat> so that means that if you have a broad gain spectrum and nothing else to limit what the laser does, you're going to get emission at every single uh, longitudinal mode, meaning transmission mode, of the fabric pro that's within the gain uh, spectrum that's above the loss spectrum. Okay. So <clears throat> what's the deal with finesse? Yes. How many peaks, peak widths fit within adjacent pieces? So that tells you the resolution of wavelength that you can see with the fabric pro. Okay. All right, so now what we want to do is talk about thin films. And specifically, let's do a thin film on a substrate. And so if we set the problem up, we have this thin film of refractive index N2 sitting on a substrate of refractive index N3 immersed in some medium of refractive index N1, where this will label B2, <clears throat> the thickness of the film. And uh, actually, let's just make it a B2 now. Okay, so this situation, we consider an instant ray, so we've got a plane wave instant at theta 1, refracts at theta 2, and then down at the other interface refracts at theta 3. <clears throat> so this geometry, what does it remind you of? Hayden diffringers? Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's like a dielectric slab, except instead of N1, we have N3. Okay. So <clears throat> presumably our analysis of the dielectric slab will apply if we change this to N3. Okay. So just one thing to note is that the Fresnel reflection coefficient here we call it R12. And for the dielectric slab here, we called it R21, but we don't have material one here anymore, so let's call it R23. <coughs> okay. Then the phase change between adjacent rays, we can write as before, four pi over lambda naught, N2, B, cosine, theta 2. Nothing different about that. And, um, and then remember that for the dielectric slab, we came up with R121, the reflection coefficient starting in medium 1, slab of 
medium two, and then medium one's on the other slide, other side. Well, <clears throat> this, let's call it R123. And then I'm just going to skip the algebra and go right to the result. Because the algebra is just the same as before. This is equal to R12 minus R23 E2B minus J delta over 1 plus R12 R23 E2 minus J delta. Oh, I got a sign wrong. It's a plus sign right there. <coughs> so that is the reflection coefficient for this system taking into account all of the multiply reflected rays. And likewise, we can write down the transmission coefficient, T123, as being T12, T23, e to the minus j delta over 2 over 1 plus R12, R23, e to the minus j. Okay, well that was easy. I got the expression for the reflection and transmission coefficients of a thin film, take into account all of the multiple reflections inside the film. Yeah, question. So it sets T's in the top and then R's in the bottom for T? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I just don't remember. I guess that's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> so now. <clears throat> Let's just notice sort of the functional form. Uh, R123 clearly is a function of delta. Delta being the phase shift. And it depends on wavelength, refractive index of the uh, film, thickness of the film, uh, propagation angle within the film, <clears throat> which is the same as saying propagation angle outside the film. Uh, using Snell's law to get, get to here. And, um, and then T123 likewise is a function of delta. So that means that, I mean, looking at this, in general, that's complex, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a complex uh, number that continuously varies as a function of delta. Same with this. Now what if I had R123 and I let delta go to zero? How can delta go to zero? Well, usually it's if D goes to zero. Which is the same thing as saying, I don't have a film. So what would the reflection coefficient be in that case? R13. Yeah, R13. And you can verify that's the case by plugging in for R12, R23, delta, let delta go to zero, do the algebra, and you will get back R13. You can do that for the S case, you can do that for the P case. Okay, and so likewise then, T123, as delta goes to zero, has to go to T13. <clears throat> okay. Now notice that the delta is in a complex exponential. So that's going to, going to be periodic with a, a period of 2 pi in units of delta. So that means if I had R123 of delta and I add 2 pi to it, it doesn't change anything, that's still just R123 of delta, right? And over here, <coughs> T123, if I add 2 pi to delta, then that's going to be T123 of delta, but I also have this e to the minus j delta over 2 here, and if delta, if I add another 2 pi, then basically this is going to be e to the minus j pi, and so I'm going to have a minus sign here. And that minus sign just says, oh, I've got a 180 degree phase shift on the transmission. Okay. What about the 
So here, <coughs> if I put delta, you got it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, could you go ahead and continue explaining? Because I don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if we take delta plus 2 pi, stick it in here, then that's just e to the minus j delta. And up here, we'll have an e to the minus j pi multiplied. Okay, so <clears throat> notice then we can combine those two facts and recognize that r123 of 2 pi is what? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, r123 of 0. And R123 of 0 is R13. 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 <coughs> and so T123 of 2 pi is minus T13. So if we're getting about that 180 degree phase shift, it's like the film isn't even there. It's kind of wild. Could you, sorry, I missed, how does 2 pi make it R13? Because if we look here and compare this, that's saying, oh, delta is 0. Oh. Delta is 0, that's R13. Oh. Huh. Makes sense? Okay. So, so for certain thicknesses of the film, bottom line is, looks like the film isn't there. So you can use the film as a filter type thing? Well, so you can put a film on there and have the whole thing looks like, look like the film isn't there. Is that dependent on wavelength? Yeah, yeah, because here. Yeah, for a particular wavelength. Uh, it looks like the film isn't there for purposes of judgment and, and, and reflection. But not for purposes of like like refraction, like you will still see the. Oh well, no, I mean it doesn't matter what I put here. Theta three is related to theta one oh, by its Snell's okay. law, so it makes no difference what I got there, in terms of the angle theta three given theta one, unless I have total internal reflection. But it turns out you can't do that in most normal. It'll be tiny. Mm -hmm. yeah, well. but, but D isn't dependent on lambda naught, so I'm not seeing how. So like, if D is equal to zero, then the film just isn't there, so then that's just the problem. Right, the film isn't there. But for a given wavelength and instance angle, <coughs> you can pick a D so that it also looks like the film isn't there, even oh, though it is there. OK, OK. Why we make that delta be equal to 2 pi. OK, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why would you want to do that? Well, maybe this material is sensitive to something in the atmosphere, and so you put encapsulation on it to protect it, but you don't want this to disturb the optical properties. Well, you can do it. It's not a problem. If we look here for the case of, let's say we have normal instance, so theta 1 is 0 degrees. <clears throat> and we look at the case of delta equal 2 pi, then we can solve for the thickness, and the thickness will be equal to lambda naught over 2 and 2. So I'll let you do the algebra. But what is lambda naught over n2? Yeah, that's the wavelength in the film. So this is saying that to get pi equal to, or delta equal to 2 pi, we need the thickness of the film at normal instance to be one half of the wavelength where the wavelength measures in the film. 
so in other words, the film is a half-wave length thick. And if we have a half-wave length thick film, then that's what the film looks like in terms of voltage properties. And we call this a latent layer. Because it doesn't really do anything. <clears throat> and it turns out latent layers have really useful uses. In fact, isn't it just one of those things where we can go get like eight lambda yeah. or something like that? Because lambda of two is in fact two times the energy of ten times. Yeah, so in other words, we could multiply this by an integer and we'd have the same thing. Now, will that keep flipping the sign on the screen? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, if you so you basically have format. minus one raised to the nth power yep. in this image. <coughs> okay. All right. Well, that's kind of curious. Um, so, now what we want to do is we're just going to kind of hold this thought in terms of latent layers uh, because we'll see them again, uh, not today, but uh, in another lecture. Um, now what we want to do is say, hmm, this is the reflection coefficient for this system. If I want to make uh, a situation in which I have an anti-reflection coating. Mm -hmm. Now it's kind of obvious what we have to do if we try to do it with a single layer. What we want is for R123 to be zero. And if it's zero, then we're going to have the, an anti-reflection coating. We'll have no reflected light. And so for that to be zero, then we need the numerator to be zero. R12 plus R23 e to the minus delta has to be equal to zero. Now, let's just consider the case of normal instance. And um, if we look at normal instance, then to really go anywhere with this, we have to look at the TE case and we have to look at the TM case because the reflection coefficients are different. So for TE, we have that R sub S12 is N1 minus N2 over N1 plus N2. R sub S23 will be N2 minus N3 over N2 plus N3. If we had TM, we'd have RP12 is N2 minus N1 over N2 plus N1. And RP23 is N3 minus N2 over N3 plus N3. <coughs> right? That's that all makes sense from the Fresnel reflection coefficients. Okay, and clearly RP12 is just negative RS12. RP23 is negative RS23, as we would expect. We've already been through how we assume the different directions for the for the electric field in the two different cases, which gives us a minus sign in those, in those results. Okay, now let's let's assume that n1 is less than n2 is less than n3. So that would be where we had, for example, n3, let's say, is a piece of glass, n1 is air. And N2 is a film where the refractive index is somewhere between air and glass. Okay, so that's kind of a normal situation. Then, in that case, notice that RS12 is less than zero. RS23 is less than zero. In other words, they have the same sign. Okay, if R12 and R23 have the same sign, how can we ever get that to go to zero? No exponential. 
Yeah, that complex exponential has to have a very specific value. What value is it? Pi. We have to have that delta is pi. Have any hope of getting that to go to zero. Now, over here, for this situation, we have RP12 is greater than zero. RP23 is greater than zero. Same point, they have the same sign. So the only way we can get this to go to zero is if delta is pi. So if we flip the sign on the second term, term right. Okay, so if I set delta equal to pi, I'm at normal instance, I can solve for the thickness. And what will the thickness of the layer be? Knowing that we've already done that. When delta is 2 pi, at normal instance, the thickness is half a wavelength. It's got to be a quarter wavelength. So you can do the algorithm. It's simple. And you find that this is lambda naught over 4n2. That's just the refractive index in the film. So the film has to be a quarter wavelength thick. So to make an anti-reflection coating, the first criteria is <coughs> this, that the film thickness is a quarter wavelength thick. So the wavelength is measured in the film material. Okay, so if delta is equal to pi, then what we're left with here is that R12 must be equal to R33 to satisfy this equation. Okay, and if you plug in, you know, let's say we've got TE, well, here's R12, here's R23. We set them equal, you know, or if it's TM, R12, R23, set them equal, and then we need to solve for what is the refractive index that we're looking for for the film. And if we solve for it, just some trivial algebra, we find that N2 must be the square root of the product of N1 and N3. Is that what the answer is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question. Why didn't you set R12 equal to 1, 3? Well, I guess I didn't, I didn't see how it flows from that to the R12 equal to Here. So we have that. Um, is that just to make it zero, right? Yeah, because zero is R12 plus R23 <coughs> e to the minus j pi. And this is just oh, minus. Yeah, okay. Okay, so to make an anti-reflection coating with a single layer, it's really easy. This is our first criteria, quarter wavelength thick in the medium. This is our second criteria, refractive index of the film has to be the square root of the product of the ambient and the substrate refractive indices. That's it, that's all there is to it. So that's pretty nice that it works out so well. So let's say that um, we had some glass, and the refractive index of that glass is 1.52, and we're in the air, refractive index of 1, and we want to know what film should we put on that um, piece of glass in order to have an anti-reflection coating at normal instance. Well, <clears throat> what we can do is um, say, uh, well, it's easy enough to calculate what the N2 is. So N2, and I'm going to call this ideal, is clearly just the square root of 1.52, right? Okay, and the square root of 1.52 is 1.23. Okay, 
right? So we look around and we find, ah, shoot. There is no material that has a refractive index of 1.23. So darn, we cannot make a single layer anti-reflection coat because of lack of materials. Can you do multiple layers or triple layers? Do multiple right? layers. So, so before we do multiple layers, let's ask the question, well, how good can we do given available materials? So we look around and we find, well, the lowest refractive index material we can stick on a piece of glass is magnesium chloride. And magnesium fluoride has a refractive index of 1.37. So that's not really that close to 1.23. So, you know, how, how good can we do? Well, the first thing is we need to choose the thickness for the film. And what thickness should we choose? According to what our wavelength for the hair pal. Okay, so we have some wavelength, whatever it is. Well, with respect to that being wavelength. I mean, with respect to that. Yeah, what do, do we do? Do we do um, lambda naught over 4 N2, where N2 is the mag chloride, or it's the ideal one? Yeah, it, that would be an interesting line of uh, inquiry to pursue. And so we pursue it, and it turns out what we find out is you want this to be the refractive index of whatever material it is you've got. That's the best you can do. So you don't want it to be the quarter wave for the material you don't have, that you wish you had you end up making a quarter wave for the material you do have. And then we need to calculate, well, what is R123 for this non-ideal refractive index? And, um, <clears throat> and let's calculate the magnitude squared. Capital R. Mm -hmm which is the capital R, the reflectance, so it's the power reflect reflectance. And so that's just going to be R12 plus R23 e to the minus J one. It's also calculated with that material. Mm -hmm. And that'll give us a value of? Five. And so, and then we have one plus R12, R23, e to the minus j pi. So the e to the minus j pi, in both cases, it just flips the sign here, right? That's, that's the only result. So magnitude squared. And, and if we do the algebra, it turns out what we end up with is N1, N3, minus N2 squared, 20 squared, over N1, N3, plus N2 squared, quantity squared. Which you can see that if we'd had the ideal material, clearly that would be a zero. Yes, uh-huh. Okay, so when I don't have the ideal material and I just do the best I can do, set the thickness to be a quarter wave in that material, then this is the reflectance I come up with. So let me give it a name. Let's call it the residual reflectance. But it's, you can see it's trivial to get from R123. Okay. So, 
In the case of this particular example, if we have um, the case of no coating, then the reflectance is just going to be 1.52 minus 1 over 1.52 plus 1 quantity squared. And if we work that out, that is 4.3. If we use the mag fluoride, <coughs> so mag fluoride, the reflectance, and I'm just going to subscript it residual because we you know, designed it at a quarter wave and we know this is what we end up with. It turns out it's 1.2%. So we got about a factor of three reduction in the reflectance by going with the mag fluoride coating over no coating. Yeah? Is that what they put on glasses? Yes, that is what they put on glasses. So for those of you with glasses, if you take your glasses off and uh, just catch a reflection in your glasses, what does the reflected light, what color is it? Purple, green, violet. So, Ivan, what's your? Mine is purplish. Purplish, okay. Zach? Yeah, it's um, a little bit of green. A little bit of green? Okay. Chase? Yeah, uh, purple and green. Purple and green? Mala? I think purple. Purple? Okay. Blue. If it's purple, they're good. And we'll, we'll go over it next time. We're going to look at the um, reflection spectrum because basically, you're designing for a single wavelength, right? So that means when you go off wavelength, then this is going to break down. You're not going to have as much reflection reduction. So if you're seeing a purplish reflection, that means you're doing pretty good throughout the visible, except when you get to the shortest wavelength. If you see a green reflection, you've got a really crappy anti-reflection coating. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, that means that the, the, the wavelength at which the reflection is a minimum is somewhere else if you're seeing green. And green is right in the middle of, our, of, of the spectrum that we are sensitive to with our eyes. And that, that's where you're doing the worst with reflection coating, right? And reflection coating is really good. So why would that be? Is that just because they just use the material maybe? Or? No, it's just that they're out of calibration on the definition. So what is, what is the wavelength of green light? Just give us a correction. Uh, 500 nanometers, a little, little over 500 nanometers. So where did I put our D to? Oh, so here, if we calculate the thickness that we need here, which is this quarter wave, it turns out to be 91.2 nanometers. So it's thin. It's quite thin. Is that hard to do? Turns out, no, it's not hard to do at all. I mean, that's <clears throat> what these thin film deposition materials and clean rooms are for. Put down thin films of materials, whether it's e-beam evaporation, RF sputtering, VC sputtering, thermal evaporation. Those are typically the methods that you've used. I mean, you can do a low pressure chemical vapor deposition, but not for mag fluoride. Um, and then there are other deposition methods, but uh, then it gets back to when you do the thin, fil thin film deposition, what's the morphology of the film that you get? And if you have a low surface energy or a low, or low energetic process like, say, e-beam evaporation, then what happens is <clears throat> if this is your substrate and you're depositing mag fluoride or something else, then usually what happens is you get kind of columnar growth like this and those columns kind of spread out and then they merge but it's still this this column like morphology and bottom line is you get these voids in the film and so those voids reduce the refractive index clearly 
Uh, and then depending upon the nature of the material, if you've got a hydroscopic material, that it wants to take up moisture from the atmosphere. So take water from humid air. And then what you find is that the refractive index changes to, as a function of salinity. Does the water saturation, saturation of the pores will change as a function of salinity. For some films, that can actually cause mechanical degradation of the uh, film and the, and the delamination, which is always bad. So in order to improve that in a heating evaporator, what you have to do is add more energy to the process. So in an heating evaporator, what you have, well, you've got this crucible of material, you know, some pellets or something, powder, and then you've got this electron beam that you're basically dumping energy into your material with until you heat it up enough that it becomes molten. And then it kind of um, uh, boils. And so now you've got these molecules whizzing out of the crucible, and then you've got your substrate up here catching them or in the path of the molecules. And the substrate in comparison is quite cold. And so what happens is the molecules will come down and they'll pretty much just stick wherever they hit because it's a cold surface. And what you want is to add some energy so that the molecules, when they stick, they're not really stuck. That they can move around and minimize, and get to a location where they can minimize their energy which gives you a much more dense film quality. And so how do you do that? Well, there are numerous ways, but, but one key way is take an ion gun and basically bombard the surface with, say, argon ions. And then the, the uh, kinetic energy of the argon ions gets imparted to whatever it is you're trying to deposit. That allows the molecules to have more energy. They move around. They find a better spot and then you get a denser film. So if you ever have to buy an heating evaporation system and you care about your film quality, then usually you want to get an ion gun. So do we have an ion gun in our heating evaporator? No, so why didn't I, why didn't I get one when I bought that heating evaporator? Probably the same thing. Good price. Because we wanted more stuff. So we got the sputtering system and a bunch of other the STS, that was half a million dollars when you buy that. So that took up a lot of the money. But <clears throat> that's basically how it's done. Okay, so let's, um, let's do another example. Let's say that we have a different kind of glass. Let's say it's a heavy flint glass. And in that case, the refractive index, 1.72. And then air, refractive index is 1. And again, let's do the mag fluoride. Refractive index of 1.27. Then, <clears throat> again, the thickness is just going to be the same. This is, I should say, this is for a wavelength of 500 nanometers. So the thickness will be the same, you know, quarter wave in the mag fluoride. So no difference there. If we calculate the um, reflectance, so R13 magnitude squared uh, would be 7%. This almost double the reflection from the heavy flint glass compared to the regular soda lime glass. And um, with the mag fluoride, the residual reflectance is 0.2%. Yeah, it's much better uh, because the ideal refractive index in thin to ideal is 1.31. So it's closer to the 1.37 that we actually have. But we basically get an improvement of 14 times less reflection 
by using a non-optimal um, single layer anti reflection coating. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah. So I'm kind of looking at this from the perspective of kind of microwave engineering mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, when kind of like moving around on the Smith's chart, there are a lot of other solutions that you can do by not using quarter wave matching type things. Mm -hmm. Are there other solutions that do get us better if we don't assume that pi in the delta there? I haven't looked at it since I don't know offhand. But it will be the same as in the microwave engineering case. So okay, very exact. Yeah, it looks very similar. Yeah, so. it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the refractive index is related to the impedance. Mm -hmm. So we could couch all of this in terms of impedance at optical frequencies, but that's not how it's usually done. So we're using refractive index. In the microwave world, then it's more impedances. Yeah. It's just a simple uh, arbitrary relationship between the two. Is that Matthew? I was just thinking if there's something you can do with like multiple layers and reflect several wavelengths well, or not. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So you like target one wavelength and target another with a different layer. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, so you have to target the two jointly, and then you have to optimize the layers. Um, for the condition on both wavelengths. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in fact, the next topic is two layer AR coatings. Uh, we're kind of out of, out of time uh, since we have to uh, finish early because the dedication happens at two and I've got to be over there and there's a bunch of stuff we're supposed to do. In fact, we were supposed to cancel classes. I forget what time we were supposed to start that, but um, I think we're kind of running I couldn't stand to miss a day without you guys. So. <laughs> okay. So next time we'll do two layer air coatings. We'll start off with that and then we'll, and we'll move on later. And we don't really have enough time to go over uh, the general case of multi layer coatings. So what I'm going to do is give you a paper that um, uses an analytical method to treat a special case, and it turns out the special case is used all the time, and so it's really valuable to know. And, um, you know, if we had time, what I'd do is we'd, we'd learn some uh, thin film design software. I mean, that would be great for us, too, but we just don't have time in the house. So, but you'll at least get the basic ideas and find out what it is. So if you ever have to do it, not a big deal. Okay, well, great, guys. We will see you on Thursday.